In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, I thank God for the beautiful time we have had so far, and I pray that the rest of our meeting also would go very well, and we would be able to take away from this meeting lots of ideas that would give us more hope for unity. Uh, I very much enjoyed what uh, Bishop Michael said, and it's very interesting that he put it in a practical context. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, a test for our ideas that if they can have some benefits, because you know the Quran says the example of truth and falsehood is like rain coming and then this rain is flowing and taking with itself some you know mods whatever so you would have bubbles and the quran says falsehood is like bubbles that cover the surface and you don't see except those bubbles but truth is the real water but when the Quran wants to talk about the truth, says, This bubbles go away. But what benefits people would remain. So this is why I always say truth is something that benefits. Truth is not something that would be neutral or harmful. Islamically, the concept of Hope is very, very important. And I think still I am discovering. There's much about this concept. And about two years ago, uh, when it was uh, Iranian New Year, I had some reflections on that and shared with the community about the concept of hope. And also when we were in Lopiano in one of Wings of Unity, so we talked about prophethood and hope. And it was interesting that at the same time the Pope spoke in Rome about hope. And so it's, it seems it's a question of humanity and especially question of our age. Because in this age, uh, more than ever, we are aware of the problems. Maybe in the past people were aware of the problems of their city or their country. But we are almost aware of any problem in the world. Even we are aware of the problems that can happen after 50 years, 100 years, you know, like environment, you know, global warming. So, so much to worry that unless you have deep connection with God, you become really despaired and you're not able to function. So I think hope is increasingly more important. Uh, for Christianity, hope has always been very important, you know, uh, but I think it's becoming more important. And for Muslims, the same. <coughs> One of the concepts that we find in our supplications, for example, uh, we Shia have a supplication which uh, we try to read and reflect in the months of Ramadan every night. Some people do, some people maybe less often. It's Du'ai Abu Hamza. So a person called Abu Hamza Somali reports this du'a from our fourth Imam. It's taking one and a half hour if you want to read it. So one of the things that we say to God in that uh, dua, that supplication, is that we say, Our Lord, truly we have great hope in you. In Arabic, we have the, uh, you know, Raja as hope and Amal also, sometimes as hope, but sometimes can be wish. So we say to God, uh, we have great hope in you. Because I think when you want to take something from someone, depending on the character of that person, you press some special, you know, button. So, for example, if someone is a business-minded person, so I have to say something that would motivate his business mind. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I think, okay, you are going to make some profit here. You know. If someone, for example, is a, f- a person who is fearful, I should, you know, press on the button that creates fear. What is the thing that a very kind and generous and self-giving person would find irresistible? If you go to God, what can you say? that would be irresistible for God to, you know, to answer. So in our prayers, it seems that the fact that we say to God that I have come to you with hope is something that God is not going to disappoint. You know, if someone comes to me and says, you know, Sheikh Shumali, I have come all the way to your home hoping that you help me. If I have any sense of novelty, uh, I would never disappoint such a person. He has not done anything for me. He has not brought any gifts for me. He's not going to pay anything. But he says, I have come here with hope. A novel person (laughs) never disappoints someone who has hope in him. And God never disappoints people who have hope in him. So it's very... Uh, important aspect of our relation with God that knowing what God does and who he is should just produce hope but on the other hand the irony is that I am also aware of myself and I have not done good and I have not been a good servant of God so This then makes me very hopeless. So, for for example, in our prayers, we say, uh, My Lord, how can I call you while I know who am I? So, who am I to ask you? But also, how can... I not call you when I know who you are. So this is the challenge that is actually very beautiful, that gives a balance. My hope is not in me or my actions. My hope is in my Lord. And I am aware of my shortcomings and problems. But still I have hope in him and I would go to him and... Our uh, texts say that when you expect something from God and you see that problems are many and in a human sense you are most hopeless, that's the time that you have to be most hopeful. For example, let me read for you one beautiful hadith. Uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad said, tarju, arja min tarju. With respect to what you don't have hope for, be more hopeful. <laughs> because when you have hope for something, it means that you are relying on human attempts and human solutions. But when you do your best and you are still hopeless, there's nothing more that I can do. Situation has gone out of our control. Yeah? It's someone who is droning. If you reach that level of desperation that we talked on Saturday, you feel really desperate for God's help, then the chance of God helping is more. And then the Prophet mentions the example of Moses. He says, You know, when Moses with his family was traveling in the night, and it seems it was a dark and cold night, and maybe his most important concern, or at least one of the most important concerns, but maybe the most 
how to take his family safely. He was not thinking about a big thing happening, just how to take them safely. But then he was alert. So he saw on the side, right or left, I don't know, but must be on the side, not in front. He saw fire and he said to his family, he said to his family, stay here. And because he said, stay here, I realized that it was not in front of them because otherwise they could all have gone and reached it. So they stay here. I see a friendly fire. I go, maybe I can take this fire uh, so that, you know, either we can warm ourselves or find guidance. So no hope for receiving revelation and being spoken by God. But then actually in that moment, the most important event of the life of Moses up to that point happened and that God spoke to him from that bush. Or we have a similar hadith from our first Imam. And there is this example of Moses, the same example that he went to take fire, but he came back as a prophet. And we have an example of the queen of Saba. That queen of Saba went to Solomon to ask him for, you know, not invading or attacking their country, whatever. But over there, she embraced faith. So she never thought she's going to embrace faith there. Or the magicians. Magicians, uh, when Pharaoh wanted to defeat Moses, he called the best magicians. And these magicians, uh, you know, before they started, they asked uh, Pharaoh, are you going to pay us? There is a reward for us if we manage to win Moses. And he said, yes, you be, and you become also very close to me. So they never expected anything greater than money or position, worldly position. But when they saw the miracles of Moses, they were the first people to admit that this is act of God. This is not magic. So Pharaoh brought them to defeat Moses, but they became the first people to believe in Moses. <laughs> and therefore Pharaoh was very angry with them. And he said, so Moses must be your master in magic. You, you have learned from him magic and now you are doing all this. And he said, I'm going to crucify you. I'm going to crucify you on the uh, you know, trunk of the day tree. And it is amazing that these people who were magicians... And they came to defeat prophets of God. They had such a transformation, conversion, that when Pharaoh threatened them to death, they said, La vaira, inna ila rabbina la munqalibun. No problem. We have returned to our Lord. So they had no such expectation, but because they acted properly at that moment, then God accepted them and made them very high in their faith. And then they became martyrs. So, whenever we are dealing with someone like God, you should never let anything to make you hopeless. And you should know that God has all the means and all the reasons because of his love, his mercy. He has all the means and all the reasons to help us faithful people. The only thing that we have to make sure is that our hope is realistic, it's not illusion. Because sometimes I have hope, but this is illusion, it's not really hope. For example, a farmer who doesn't you know, do anything, doesn't prepare the ground, doesn't you know, plant properly, doesn't take care of the farm and says, I have hope that I have, I'm going to have a good or great harvest. This hope is baseless. This is not hope. 
This is void. Hope is the fruit of a tree. It has roots. But if someone just has hope, which, which is not based on anything, this is not hope. It's like an artificial fruit. It's not a real fruit. Or a student who doesn't study, doesn't do homework, doesn't study, doesn't do anything. I so I have hope that I will get best results. This is not hope. This is illusion. This is what we call unrealistic desire. Faith is not such a welcoming place for this kind of hope. This kind of hope is very harmful to the faith. <coughs> and if faithful people develop such kind of hope, they become very lazy and always they put God, you know, in corner to help them. And God, you know, many times help us. But, you know, God says you have to learn. You know, how many times I should come and help you because of your laziness or not planning properly, not, you know, working together, not coordinating. <laughs> you know, like, for example, uh, I am, for example, uh, aware that my father is the head teacher of the school. And then all the time, you know, I come late, you know, I, you know, fight people and say, okay, my f father you know, is going to help me. Maybe father once, twice, but he cannot help you all the time. If he's a just person, he cannot help you all the time when you are doing all these silly things. So faithful people should not expect God to do favoritism. Faithful people should do their things properly. And then be sure that for anyone who does things properly, God's support is available. Actually, the Quran says God not only supports people who seek, uh, you know, high ranks in spirituality. In the, even God supports people who work for worldly things properly. The Quran says, Man arad al wa sa'alaha sa'yaha. The one who is interested in the hereafter and does proportionate efforts. Or the one who yurid al ajala, the one who does. Hope, you know, dunya, this world. But they really make efforts. God will help them also. So basically, this world is a place that people who work hard and make efforts, they should be hopeful that they can get the results. But especially so, people of God. God even help people of, you know, worldly you know, aims if they work hard. But if someone is a if the community of God whose aims and objectives are godly, they make things properly, they plan properly, they take advice, they consult, they have all these rational means of success and they put their hope and trust in God. For them there is no limit. So this is one aspect of hope that I wanted to mention. And also another thing that very much is mentioned in our hadith is about <clears throat> the balance between hope and fear. Because sometimes we go to one extreme. Either we become totally hopeful and then we don't have any fear this is dangerous. If a soldier is too hopeful and take unnecessary risks, it's a problem. But if you become also too fearful, it's a problem. So we have many, many uh, hadiths that says you have to find balance between hope and fear. And I think one way of understanding the balance is to see the amount of hope and fear that you have makes you more active or more passive. When hope is too little and fear is too much, you become passive. Or when hope is too much and fear is too little, again, you become passive. When you have the right balance of both, you are active, but try to be wise. 
We need to be active and wise. Not just hopeful and you become unwise or too fearful and then you are not active. So fear produces wisdom and hope produces activism. And we need both. We need to have this wise activism. Just two cents. Uh, it's my two cents <laughs> about <laughs> hope. Uh, uh, I couldn't do justice, uh, but just to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.